Okay, so welcome to this um, fourth in the in this uh, HMI Data AI and Society series of seminars. Um, we're delighted to have with us today um, Clinton Castro uh, from Florida International University. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their continuing connection to culture, community, land, sea, and sky. And paying my respects to um, elders, past, present, and future. Um, I'm recording this in Michalago, which is Narago lands. Um, so I pay my respects to. Uh, the Narago people in particular. Uh, so um, this seminar by Clinton. Uh, Clinton's an assistant professor of philosophy at Florida International University, um, where he um, went after a PhD at University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, where he was supervised by Mike Teitelbaum, a uh, close friend of the ANU. Um, Clinton's going to be talking about um, just machines. Um, as usual, we're going to keep things, the introduction um, short and sharp. Um, so Clinton, if you'd like to share your screen uh, with your slides, uh, we'll get started. Sure. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. I'm very excited to be with you all today. And this will be my first, this will be my first uh, go at a Zoom presentation. So hopefully it all goes smoothly. <laughs> Fingers are crossed. Okay, so um, I guess I could just jump into my next slide. Um, I may, just as a heads up, I may talk a little bit quickly because I do want to get through everything on time and I have a little bit to get, quite a bit to get through. So if I, I hope I don't go too quickly. I'll try to be articulate, but also I will be trying to stay on schedule. So I might go a little quickly. Um, hopefully not too quickly. Let's see. Okay. So uh, my broad topic, my really broad topic today, most broadly speaking, is fairness as it applies to predictive scores, uh, which I understand as mathematical expressions used to describe or predict a group or individual's attributes or future behavior. Just some quick examples. I think a lot of us might be familiar with this, but here are some examples of how they've been used. Um, famously, criminal justice, for example, whether to grant bail, um, predictive policing, uh, in figuring out where to send officers or who to target. Um, education uh, is an example we'll talk about a little bit more today. Um, namely, uh, one example being determining effectiveness of teachers. Um, and then finally, here's a really big set of examples. This isn't the only other context, but it's a big one, uh, the market. Um, so um, predictive scores have been used to determine consumers' age, ethnicity, gender, frequency of purchasing general apparel, television usage, job security, allegiance to, dry, to buying name, brand, or generic drugs, likelihood of moving to another merchant, likelihood of smoking, and maybe one of the most famous examples, uh, likelihood of being pregnant. But there are hundreds of, uh, hundreds of more scores, maybe even thousands, um, in the context of the market. Um, now, so I'll be talking about those today and fairness as it applies to them. More narrowly, this talk actually has two goals. I usually try to stick to one, but I'm, I'm shooting for two today. Um, one is, um, I really, one motivation behind this paper is I have a lot, and I'm sure we all do, have some really smart friends, maybe friends that we think are smarter than ourselves, that uh, have not jumped in onto this topic yet. And I take that as not only do I have friends that haven't jumped in on this yet that I think very highly of, but also, lots of philosophers haven't jumped into this topic yet uh, or these issues. And so one motivation of this paper is actually to provide something of an uh, overview of machine learning and fairness in machine learning uh, so as to invite other philosophers and other academics into this, this topic. Um, I'm hoping that what I have to say isn't so basic that it's redundant for a lot of the people here today. I am hoping I have something for everyone. Um, but. Uh, if some of this is redundant, especially given our interdisciplinary crowd, I would love to hear feedback on whether at all this is a good way of trying to summarize sort of a high level um, overview of, of the, I think, kind of key concepts of machine learning and fairness in machine learning. And I should mention, I've switched, I already used the word, word machine learning. The reason that's appearing here is because that's a, a common tool for developing predictive scores. So, so that's the connection. Um, and then my, my second goal is to make a diagnosis. Um, and this actually is served very well by giving an overview of things first. And we'll, th this will kind of come up later in the talk. But what I'm going to do is I'll look at a bunch of different proposals of sort of what fairness in machine learning amounts to and a bunch of counterexamples of the, those proposals. And then what I want to say is, why have we been able to find counterexamples to all these proposals? And I want to kind of go up beyond the local counterexamples and kind of give a general diagnosis, like what's, what seems to be like the larger problem here? Um, and so uh, I'll be offering a kind of a diagnosis of why we have not landed on a, a measure yet. 
of fairness in predictive scoring or machine learning. So that's like kind of like the basic, those are my goals. Uh, here's the, the plan. Uh, I, I'll work through some machine learning and bias. Um, machine learning and how bias can kind of work its way into machine learning. Um, I'll work through, as I said, some fairness measures and their discontents. I'll offer a diagnosis of kind of why these haven't been working. And then um, some really broad general lessons, maybe even so broad that they're like more like in invitations for kind of further comment and discussion. Uh, but just some, some, some lessons from, from, every, from what I think is a, the correct diagnosis of the situation. Okay, so here's an example I wanna talk through really quickly. Um, we'll, we'll talk through sort of three examples that, that'll be touchstones throughout the paper. Um, here's the, the only, I think, uh, non-controversial one. Uh, this is sort of my model for machine learning. Uh, so I call the example Frenchies and Boston Terriers. Um, to anyone who doesn't know, Frenchies and Boston Terriers are breeds of dogs that look so at least somewhat similar. They're both short, have short hair, have stub noses. And they're, the kind, they're, they're, they're breeds that I could imagine people confusing. Uh, and, I could Im and this is a somewhat contrived example, of course, but we can imagine that you have trouble telling Frenchies and Boston Terriers apart and you want to get better at this. And so you, develop, you want to develop a system for telling the difference. One way you might do this is you might go to the local dog park with an expert, make some notes on the dogs that they classify as Boston Terriers and Frenchies, look for some patterns in your notes, and use those patterns as a guide for future sorting. Um, like I said, a little contrived, but hopefully like a somewhat intuitive model of how you might solve this problem that you have. Uh, now, um, that isn't all that different from what a computer does when it uses machine learning uh, to mine um, data sets to find patterns. Um, so we can, if you can kind of get how that, that, that process works as I described, you can imagine doing that in a computer assisted way, uh, filling out some spreadsheets maybe, uh, looking for some patterns and, and, and you're off to the races. Uh, that's, it, and this isn't how all machine learning works obviously, but it's like a touchstone, nice little simple uh, model. Uh, okay. Um, so the, the, the method I just talked through is something that we can call classification. Um, and the next thing that I want to talk about is sort of, I'll, I'll do two things quickly in two steps. I want to break down the process I just described into some steps, three steps. And then I want to talk about how at each step bias can kind of slip in uh, to the process um, inadvertently. And then that'll raise the question, well, how do we detect bias? There's, there's ethical concerns. I gave all these examples. Machine is, learning is used in all sorts of uh, really important aspects of people's lives. Um, and, and that motivates the kind of discussion of these uh, fairness measures. So I'll look at classification really quickly in a bit more detail uh, first. So um, slowing things down just a tad bit. Um, the first step or one of the first steps in, in the, the process I walked through is choosing what to take notes on. Um, some very quick terminology. When you choose what to take notes on, you're engaged in what will be what's called feature selection. And when you choose which labels to use for the thing that you care about, Boston Terrier, Frenchie, you're defining your target variables, the thing that you care to learn about. Second step, you go out and take some notes with your friend. Um, when you do this, you're in engaged in data collection. Uh, and you'll use this uh, data to, to train yourself. So this will be your training data. And here's a, a quick example. I think people can see my cursor. Can people see my cursor? Good. Uh, to, this is like maybe an example of what your uh, notes might look like. Okay, moving on. Um, and then, then you look for some patterns. And I think if we kind of put this on a graph, we could see, it maybe doesn't jump off the page here, but here you can see that there's kind of a pattern going, right? Where uh, I'm using dots for Boston Terriers and X's for, for Frenchies. And if we wanted to be a little bit more circumspect, we might say, we'll draw two lines, one vertical line to separate as many X's from dots as we can, and one horizontal line to do the same. And now we might have a rule, uh, supposing you have access to this data, you might say, if, if a dog's um, attributes put it in what I've labeled as quadrant D, you can go ahead and call it a Frenchie. And if that rule works for you, you're done. Uh, Kind of depends on how, how accurate you want to be, but maybe if you were no better than guessing and you just wanted to improve a little bit, maybe for the sake of, say, targeted advertising, um, uh, then maybe, maybe you're done here. Um, I guess one thing I'll say really quickly while this slide is close um, is uh, 
obviously we could do a lot better. Um, I, we could have sort of gone, gone a little more, more fancy and drawn like maybe a line here, kind of, or maybe we could have tracked more, more data points. Um, that might have been more work than we cared to do at the moment. Um, like I said, maybe this is good enough. Um, but we could get better by making things a little bit more complicated. And as simple as my example is, that's when you kind of see the need for computers, right? So we could spot those, those, those patterns that I, that I just put up there. But if we had more dimensions, more data points, more complex relationships, maybe not. Um, so the basic thought there is that cl classification could get difficult and complicated very quickly. This is why uh, machine learning has made its way into many aspects of our lives, especially um, that, that that's part of why. Another reason is that computers are cheap, data is cheap, storing data is cheap now. Um, and, and so like, this is why we see, like I said in my example with the market, we see kind of consumer scores everywhere. Um, okay, so now hopefully we have kind of a grip on how that process works. Uh, now let me just kind of talk about three ways in which um, bias can kind of slip in at each of the three steps identified. Um, so at step one, via choices what to take notes on. Um, so here's another example. We talked to the Boston Terriers and the Frenchies. Um, here's another example we'll return to a couple times. I'm calling it hiring teachers. And I'll just read the case really quickly. You're hiring teachers and you want to know which ones will be effective. You decide to look at your past hires to see which teachers have added the most value to their students' education, measured using test scores. You find that teachers that went to certain colleges added more value, so you give more teachers that went to those schools interviews. And um, that might look fine, but we can suppose, um, and, and this is gonna be true in a lot of cases, uh, that the following correlations hold. Minority and non-minority teachers tend to go to different colleges. Um, minority teachers gravitate towards schools with higher portions of minority students. The higher the portion of minority students, the poorer the funding for the school. Poor funding causes lower test scores. And now just by kind of from the outset, before we even really started, we might have geared things up so that we're gonna end up with what's going to be uh, an unfair scoring system. Okay, I'm gonna look at step two and I'll use that to introduce a second case. Uh, so at, at step two, we can introduce bias by how we're collecting our data. Um, so here's another example. This one we're gonna really talk about in, in some detail. Um, and I'll call it pretrial release. You're deciding who to release while awaiting trial. You only want to release people who will not reoffend while awaiting trial. You have data about past defendants that suggests that the number of past arrests a defendant has is positively correlated with future arrests. You use this to construct a rule that recommends only releasing those with few previous arrests. And again, somewhat predictably, um, we can end up with a problem if we suppose certain correlations hold, uh, which they do in a lot of cases. Um, for example, if we suppose that there are many crimes that are committed by white and black people at similar rates, but that, the, that black people get arrested for disproportionately often. So this is like a, an example would be uh, drug, uh, drug crimes in the United States, I think is a, I think pretty uncontested example of, of what I'm talking about there. If, 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 if we're using the pretrial release system the way I described, and we have this background fact, we will again have a, a system that just by tracking the data is not gonna look fair, and that's just because the, the, data, the data collection has not been a, a good process. Okay, lastly, uh, this will be my last example. We'll, we'll actually turn to an old, return to an old example, um, but this is like the last way in which we might have bias um, seep into the process. Um, and that's by just choices of how to balance false positive and false negatives, or basically like what our standards are for accuracy. So I have this familiar slide about the Frenchies and the Boston Terriers. And we could see here, if we use that rule, anything that's in quadrant D, just call it a Frenchie, otherwise maybe call it a, a Boston Terrier, is going to have the effect of falsely accusing um, at least some uh, Frenchies uh, of being Boston Terriers. It will also never accuse uh, a Boston Terrier of being a Frenchie. Um, and that might not be a big deal in this case. It depends on maybe what we're using the score for. Um, but we can imagine that it would be a huge deal 
if um, if this is being used for hiring or detention or whatever else. Um, one thing I didn't say previously, but now that we have this again, that is going to be important and maybe a good transition to the next thing I'll talk about, is we could imagine that um, if we had two graphs and we had tracked um, male and females, maybe there would be a clean line separating all Frenchies and Boston Terriers. And by introducing that, that third data point, maybe we could have no inaccuracy and kind of not have this problem. Um, which this is going to, this is like maybe, now that we have the slide in front of us, it might be helpful to see that. Um, that maybe by doing something as simple as just having two graphs, one for males and females, maybe the, the kind of ambiguous cases in the middle would just go away and we wouldn't have um, any inaccuracies. Um, why that's relevant should be, will be, will be clear in just a second. Um, so hopefully that's all clear. Hopefully it's all not too simple or familiar to everybody here. I, I had to worry about that, <laughs> but I guess we'll have to just kind of soldier on. Um, okay, so now I'm going to talk about, so hopefully now you, at least if, if, if no one was worried about this before, maybe you're now worried, oh, these things are being used in, for all sorts of purposes. We should care that, they, that they're fair. Um, and in non-simple examples, how might we tell? Well, um, I'm going to work through three proposals. Um, the first one um, is uh, less quantitative, um, and it and it goes like this. So one one claim is what here's what it, here's something important about fairness in machine learning. And we'll call the the the, the uh, principle anti-classification. Don't take inputs um, about a, as to whether someone belongs to a protected class. So um, don't ask for people's race, ethnicity, gender. Don't use those in your scores. Now, obviously, um, and now we're on to the counter examples. And I'll do this for each one that we'll talk about. I'll say why I think it's not sufficient and why it's not necessary. So um, it doesn't seem to me that I think, well, maybe everyone will agree that um, satisfying anti-classification is sufficient for being fair. Why? Well, we can already see this if you bought either the hiring teacher or pretrial release case. If either of those struck you as unfair, and the way that I set them up was that they don't ask for, for we can imagine at least, that they don't ask for race or gender or any, anything else, um, then we can see that satisfying anti-classification isn't going to be enough for being fair. Um, but maybe we can say, okay, well, maybe it's, maybe it's necessary. Maybe it's not sufficient, but it is necessary. Um, here's why I don't think it'll be necessary. Um, in at least some contexts, um, women tend to reoffend less often than men. Um, taking gender as an input then can prevent a score from problematically overestimating recidivism among female defendants. So if you kind of can kind of recall the, 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 the graph example and how we could maybe improve our accuracy by, by tracking gender uh, for the dogs, um, here we could say, we can kind of apply that intuition here and see that at least in some cases doing the same thing with people might allow us to, to avoid being in, in, inaccurate in ways that might seem unfair. Because if we blind ourselves to that data, we might overestimate recidivism among women, which would feel unfair to them, um, presumably. Um, before I move on to the next slide, I should say really quickly, I haven't marbled in my references um, into these slides. I have a reference slide at the end. And a lot of this discussion comes from several computer science papers with, with similar authors. There's a couple, there's like a group of people who write a bunch of papers together. I'll, I'll just kind of introduce those at the end uh, and call back to them. Um, so that's like where these definitions are coming from. Okay, so moving on to classification parity, or moving on to the next two measures, um, and I'll be presenting the next two, the last two in tandem. Um, um, let me backtrack for a second. I'm going to present the next two in tandem because they seem very similar, and also these two have been more, I think, uh, at the heart of more controversies than the last one. Um, so the first of the two is something called classification parity. Classification parity tells us to make classification errors equal across groups defined by protected attributes. And basically what that means is it shouldn't turn out that in my scoring, I tend to be less accurate about men than women or women than men or black defendants as opposed to white defendants. I should have kind of error rates that are equal across those groups. Should sound intuitive enough. Um, I, I think we can hopefully see why that sounds like attractive. 
Um, calibration, in contrast, which can sound very similar to parity, um, but we'll tease them apart. That's kind of why I'm starting with them side by side, is I'll tease them apart first. Calibration, in contrast, tells us to make outcomes, for example, re-arrest among people we identified as high risk of reoffending, probabilistically independent of projected, protected attributes given one's predictive score. Um, in, uh, in simpler terms, it's telling us that, let's suppose I judge somebody as 50% accurate. Um, if I'm good at what I'm doing, then there's about a 50% chance, I'm sorry, if I judge someone as about 50% likely to commit a crime, and I'm doing my job well, there should be about a 50% chance that they're going to go on to commit a crime. Um, knowing how I've kind of performed in the past, you shouldn't, upon learning someone's score and their gender, deviate from that 50%. It, what calibration asks us is, to, is, is basically to, it asks us to um, have our scores mean the same things for each person across protected attributes. Um, now, I think that, Classification, parity, and calibration can sound very similar, but they're not. And I have a graphic that I think should really help see why this is the case. Um, but first, I have a note on my slide that uh, another thing that people might know who, who follow this is it's been discovered that actually you cannot satisfy both of them in many, in many cases at the same time. So you have to choose between them. So if you like one, you might you have to choose against the other is, is, is the kind of a result that has kind of come out recently. Um, okay, so here's a graphic. It, this is inspired by <clears throat> some of those computer science papers I, I talked about. I've created this image on my, for my own purposes. Um, they have numbers about real systems, so their numbers are a little ragged. I thought to kind of communicate the intuition, it would be easy to just kind of make some hypothetical numbers. So these are made up numbers that do track a real phenomenon. Um, but I've kind of e smoothed them out so that they're, it's easier to kind of follow the important point. So if we want to see, if anybody wants to see why um, calibration and, par and uh, classification parity say different things, this graph can help us see it. So what I have here is basically the, some statistics on the performance of a hypothetical pretrial risk assessment tool. Um, each of these bars represents a different category. So here on the left side, we have uh, the defendants that were the black defendants that it identified as low risk. And we can see that it judged 100 defendants as low risk, 100 black defendants as low risk, and that 80% of, the, of those defendants did not go on to commit a crime or to be rearrested. So it's pretty accurate. Um, and that's the same thing for the rest of these. We have high risk and black defendants low risk white defendants, high risk, white defendants. And one thing that we can see immediately is that for the low risk black defendants and the low risk white defendants, the, they, they went on only 20% of the time to commit to, to be rearrested. So low risk means low risk, whether you're black or white, it means exactly the same thing. Um, the same thing is also true of the high risk categories, even though it's a little harder to see because this system judged more black defendants as high risk. Um, only 40% um, only 40 of them did not go on to, sorry, only 20% of them did not go on to commit to be rearrested. And that's, that's also true of the white defendants, uh, 10 out of 50 versus 40 out of 200, right? So we can see that low risk means low risk, high risk means high risk uh, in exactly the same way, whether the defendant is black or white. So it's calibrated but it doesn't satisfy parity. And um, we can see this if we pay attention to, again, these 40 um, black defendants that were identified as high risk but did not go on to commit a crime. We'll call those misclassified. It sort of identified them as people who would go on to be arrested, but these people were not rearrested. And we could see that 40 out of 300 total defendants were identified, at, were, were misclassified as high risk. That reduces to two out of 15. Whereas in the case of the white defendants, even though it's calibrated and all of the statistics for each defendant are the same, um, 10 out of 150 total were misclassified, which reduces to one out of 15. So even though the system is calibrated, it's twice as likely to identify black defendants as high risk, misclassified black defendants as high risk. And that's just a way of uh, showing uh, how classification parity 
and um, um, calibration can come apart. Sorry, I don't know if you guys can hear that. We're having some thunder. Hopefully the uh, internet doesn't go out. <laughs> um, okay, so now we'll go into my counterexamples, um, and hopefully I haven't taken too much time with this. Um, uh, I have still have a little bit to go through, but I, I think we can end in, in close to, to on time. So um, again, classification parity tells us to make uh, classification error equal across groups defined by protected attributes. Um, quickly, let's see why um, this isn't necessary for fairness. Um, recall the fact about men and women in reoffense. A calibrated score will behave a lot like our hypothetical pretrial risk system, so back like this one, except now um, it will uh, be twice as likely to identify uh, men as um, misidentified men as, 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 re as uh, high risk. Um, but if we kind of massage the context enough, this might not seem, um, this might not seem unfair. Um, maybe for the men, it first of all wasn't through uneven data collection. Maybe this was actually a true feature of, of, the, of the men in, in the kind of system that we're talking about. Um, and further, if we could massage the case even more by saying like, it could also be the case that this is like a, a a nuanced system that we're working with. And being identified as high risk doesn't mean you're going to be treated harshly. Maybe it means that you'll get social services or something like this, right? So there are ways of maybe deviating from uh, parity uh, in ways that, are, that don't strike us as unfair, right? We could do things to compensate for this. And maybe it's the fairest thing we can do. Um, the alternative being, if we calibrated the system, uh, we would, be overestimating recidivism among women and maybe detaining them without need. Um, okay, so here's why, uh, let's move on to the sufficiency question. Um, here's why it's not sufficient for fairness. Um, well, I just said that forcing parity in this case would mean systematically uh, overestimating reoffense among women, which, could, which I think would seem unfair. Uh, so uh, we, it seems that classification parity, satisfying classification parity, shouldn't be necessary or sufficient for being fair. If you guys, if you share my intuitions. Uh, um, okay, so moving on to calibration really quickly, um, which again asks us to make the same score mean the same thing for everybody, for each person. Um, now we can just kind of go through this quickly. Um, here's why um, I don't think that's sufficient for fairness. Um, we can imagine a case like pretrial release where any inequality in the scores are driven by arrest rates that don't track reoffense. So basically, if the case I walked you through where black defendants were twice as likely to be misidentified as high risk and maybe therefore detained, um, um, if that struck you as unfair, we could see calibration at odds with fairness as at least a, as a as we could see tension in the claim that satisfying calibration is sufficient for fairness. Um, but again, we could ask whether it's necessary for fairness. Um, and uh, I don't think that it is either uh, because, now this one imagines, requires a little bit of imagination, but we could imagine a situation where we try to adjust for the problem in that graph by forcing parity to at least some extent, and maybe that's the best we can do. And so maybe being identified high risk for a black defendant means something slightly different from being identified as high risk for a white defendant because we're sort of overcompensating and, and forcing fairness, forcing parity on the system in name of fairness. That might not be feasible in the real world for all sorts of reasons, but at least maybe we can kind of see how we might deviate from calibration in pursuit of fairness to compensate, for example, uneven data collection or some other sort of issue. Okay, so, um, that's kind of that's kind of like maybe the the, the meat of the the kind of the, the the talk is just kind of working through a bunch of those fairness measures and some counterexamples. Um, now I want to make like a little bit of a diagnosis beyond the local counterexamples. Why have we ran into some issues? Um, even though the terminology here isn't perfect uh, to offer a diagnosis, I want to introduce a distinction. Um, I'm gonna deviate from the terminology here, but I couldn't resist because this is a, I, I think a great story. Maybe people, I think, I assume a lot of philosophers have heard it before, but if not, um, let me introduce a, a distinction by way of telling a little story from the history of philosophy, a, a possibly apocryphal history, a story from the history of philosophy. So Sidney Morgan Besser, 
uh, at least allegedly, I think some people have said this is maybe not true, but Sidney Morgan Besser uh, once attended a protest where everyone was hit, beat up by the police. When asked if he was treated unjustly or unfairly, he said, unjustly, yes, unfairly, no. He elaborated, an officer hit me on the head with his nightstick, which was unjust, but they were doing it to everybody, so it wasn't unfair. And I think that that drives a, a nice distinction. He's using the words justice and fairness. I'm gonna use slightly different terminology, but hopefully that gives you an intuitive grip on, on, the, on these two concepts that I'm gonna introduce. This terminology and these definitions, by the way, come from that, Brad Hooker. So what Morgan Besser, or what Hunt in the Morgan Besser story is identifying as fairness, I'll call formal fairness, the equal and impartial application of rules. So the officer's treatment of the pro protesters in the story was formally fair. There was a rule, hit each protester on the head with a nightstick, and they did that. Um, but of course, that doesn't actually seem fair to us. Um, so um, while the officers may have been formally fair, um, they are not what I will say, uh, they were not, as I will say, substantively fair, or as Hunt says in Morgan Besser, um, unjust, um, where substantive fairness is the proportional satisfaction of a certain subset of applicable moral reasons, such as desert agreements, needs, and side constraints. Um, so in the story, uh, again, if we want to call that unfair, it would be substantively unfair, not formally unfair. Okay, what does that have to do with anything that I had to talk about today? Um, well, let me say a few more things. So first, distinguish a classification rule. For example, if a, suspected, if a suspected Frenchie's height and weight, put it in quadrant D, predict Frenchie. Separate that classification rule from what I'll call, I don't know if there's a word for this, but I'll call the ultimate rule, or you maybe even could use the word maxim, um, that the classification rule attempts to satisfy. So the rule in our case was label Frenchies as Frenchies or something like that. The measures of fairness that we considered uh, tell us whether a classification rule which attempts to satisfy some ultimate rule by giving instructions about what to do, results in the unequal or, par or partial application of its ultimate rule, right? So I think one way, here's my claim, of understanding what all of those rules we were looking at were up to is they were trying to give us conditions for formal fairness. Um, but I think many of our complaints about fairness in machine learning have to do with whether classification or ultimate rules uh, are substantively fair. So I think a lot of our examples were grading on our intuitions not because there was an issue with formal fairness, but because there was an issue with substantive fairness. And so that's my diagnosis of why are these, why are these rules not working out? It's because they're kind of chasing after the wrong concept, um, uh, or so I claim. Uh, so like I said, I promised some really big, somewhat vague lessons, but here's sort of, sort of three follow-up thoughts. Um, and then I guess we can kind of open it up for comments. And luckily, I don't think I went too badly over time uh, to my, uh, I'm glad about that. I was worried. Um, so first, uh, one quick lesson is maybe we need to think less about formal fairness and isolation from substantive fairness. Um, I think we can see that maybe there are a plurality of um, plausible candidates for um, uh, measures of formal fairness. And I think it would be helpful to think more about what substantive fairness requires, and also to think that maybe it requires different kinds of formal fairness in different situations. Maybe classification parity, I think we've seen that classification parity seems like a good objective in some contexts and parity in others, and maybe there's room to think about sort of when, which kind of formal fairness is, is desirable. Um, another lesson is I think we can use formal fairness as heuristics for substantive fairness. So um, what we saw in the example where we try to what we, what we saw when, there were, when we saw that there was conflict between classification parity and calibration is that when those both can't be satisfied, there's some issue with an inequality between protected class, protected groups. Um, now that might not settle the, the, the score as to whether or not there is in fact anything unfair going on, but it's definitely a red flag. And so the formal measures here could be used as heuristics, not arbiters, but for heuristics for detecting um, uh, unfairness, right? Um, and when you can't satisfy both, you are, are in that situation. Um, and then finally, um, I think we need to better understand, better our understanding of substantive, fair, substantive fairness as it relates to predictive scoring. And that's like a really, really, really big lesson, maybe, if, if you can call it a lesson. Um, but um, that's maybe, I mean, I think that's a, it's an important point. Um, I think sometimes, at least in practice, maybe sometimes 
in theory as well. Um, you get this vision of the, I don't know, like the technological context or the machine learning context as like this context where you can kind of think about things in a certain kind of way and maybe come up with some principles of fairness or whatever. But there is no such context. Um, as we started in the beginning of the talk, um, these scores are not are used in all sorts of different contexts, criminal justice, hiring, um, the market. Um, and I think it's, it, it behooves us to think really hard about what substantive fairness uh, calls for as it relates to predictive scoring with an understanding that um, that's a huge project. That's just more or less the project of asking the question of how people should be treated. Um, because it's not like machine, I, I don't know if this point is coming across clearly, but it's not like machine learning is like this one little context where we could ask narrow ethical questions. It's being used to do all sorts of things in all sorts of different ways to all sorts of different people, uh, which means that it's a big ethical project to figure out how to do this correctly. And that we should resist thinking that there's gonna be one circumspect mathematical rule that's gonna tell us uh, the right answer here. If that was the case, we would have finished ethics a while ago, I think. Um, <laughs> Um, so thank you very much. Thank you very much for your time. I'm sorry that I went over a little bit. And as promised really quickly, um, here are some papers that I relied on pretty heavily for this presentation. And these three in the middle, the Corbett Davies papers are the ones where I got a lot of my examples and my definitions. And this one in the middle is a very helpful one where I kind of then inspired that graph that I used that for me has been very helpful. I think it's like one of the most helpful images I've come across. Uh, so in thinking about this stuff. Um, so with that said, uh, thanks, and I guess we'll turn it over to, to, to questions or discussion. Thank you very much for that, Clinton. That was fantastic. Um, so the way we're going to do Q&A um, is uh, panelists will be able to raise their hands, um, and I'll sort of call on people trying to get a sort of distribution of questions across our various disciplines. Um, if you're in the audience, um, you can um, put a question up by um, writing it into the Q&A section and I will relay that to Clinton and integrate it into the discussion. Um, okay, so we'll start with a question from Atuza. Uh, okay, thanks a lot, Clinton. So um, I was wondering if, uh, like I wanted to push you basically to a little bit uh, connect your discussion to the discussions of fairness and justice in philosophy. Mm -hmm. So, for example, when you give these uh, counter examples about necessary and sufficient conditions to fairness, uh, I was wondering what do you mean by fairness there? Are you just using an intuitive conception of fairness or are you using a, like a theory of justice or theory of fairness? And the reason is that uh, I became a little bit sus uh, uh, like uh, sus uh, susceptible that uh, maybe some of these problems are not really problems with formal fairness in the context of machine learning. It's just because we don't have a theory of fairness that is going to be applicable in, in all kinds of contexts. And when you look into the history of theories of justice, there are like 10 different kinds of theories and each of them has their own benefits. Some of them are very ideal, some of them are not ideal. So I was wondering whether you see some nice analogy between these problems that arise for fairness in machine learning um, two problems that arise for choosing which theory of justice or fairness actually is the good one in philosophy and law. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, let me see. Uh, yeah. So, as you see, I, I sort of tried to resist a little bit the justice word for, for par partially for this reason uh, in in the way that I was setting this up, and I guess that what. The, the short answer to the question of whether I have a theory of justice or fairness in the back of my mind, I, I don't, um, in part because I wanted to make kind of a, a general, a really general point uh, that m might look attractive from kind of any point of view on, on this. Um, uh, so I, I don't, I'm not coming from a, a place where I have like a, a, a settled view on this. And I think that there is, I think it's fair to ask, and I think a reasonable next step would be to think hard about uh, different trade-offs between different conceptions of, of fairness and justice. Um, so I haven't, I haven't thought through, I haven't thought, thought through that yet. So I don't have a view on it. Um, um, and I could, I, I guess one other thing I should say is, um, um, is that I, I, beyond just using, I guess, fairness in an intuitive way, I, I meant to use it in a, in a somewhat broad way, obviously broader than formal fairness. Um, 
Uh, but again, I, and I think I'm just going to repeat myself here. I, I was hoping to make a point for myself, and maybe this is just for me, the, the, the thing that I kind of brought in at the end of my diagnosis was illuminating to me to figure out why things have maybe gone awry. Um, and I wanted to make that point again in, in, a, in, a general, in a general way that didn't kind of have any commitments with what kind of fairness or justice might amount to. But I could see how that methodologically might be a problem as well. And if you have any, if you have any suggestions, uh, I would be very curious to hear them, the specific ways in which you were skeptical or any connections that you see. Um, uh, so I don't know, if you, I don't know if, you, if you do or if we're not doing follow-ups. Um, I think maybe we'll do follow-ups on the Slack, um, just because I've got a bit, of a bit of a queue to go through. Um, okay. But um, yes, but please do do it there. Um, so next question is from um, Damien Clifford, um, uh, one of our lawyers. Uh, thanks very much for that. Um, like, I suppose the, the separation between formal and substantive fairness, I was wondering to what extent that can actually also be classified as a distinction between equality and equity. Um, and, you know, is substan because, like, you know, substantive fairness is going to end up being so context dependent, is it actually ever achievable? Um, I, you know, I mean, you were kind of pointing to that and that, you know, it's the big question, but I mean, I'm wondering to a certain extent whether it's actually ever going to be achievable in your view, and then to what extent that actually results in just declaring certain applications and machine learning and predictive tools unfair de facto from the outset, because they're always going to be, um, I don't know, not equitable. Yeah, so I think, I mean, to, to give a really satisfying answer to this question, I'd have to think through the last one a little bit more carefully and maybe have an answer. So maybe having a theory would, would, be, would be nice here. But I, I actually don't, um, I mean, I'm, I'm open to being wrong about this. I'm open to being wrong about everything I said. Uh, uh, but uh, I actually don't think that I'm sort of setting the bar too high or kind of setting out an unachievable goal. Um, I, it's hard to say more other than that, um, I mean, we have to look at this, the, the cases kind of case by case and side by side, I guess. But um, it seems that there are, I guess, reasonable demands that people could have for how they'll be treated by sort of automated systems. Um, and those demands can be um, um, sensitive to what's reasonable and what's kind of uh, possible. Um, so um, I guess like in the example of the pretrial risk stuff, um, for example, uh, I, I, I sort of, in my examples, had some references to how people are going to be treated, for example. And, and so I, I think that when we're using things like a pretrial risk tool, um, we, we do need to be careful about where the biases are lying and stuff like that, but also like what the system that they're part of looks like and how people are being treated. And on balance, the, whole, the, the, the thing taken as a whole can be, in my, in, in my opinion, substantively fair uh, in, in ways that wouldn't be super impossible to achieve. So um, maybe to put a little bit more meat on that, um, it, for example, if we know that we're going to have to trade off between classification parity and, and calibration, okay, maybe that's a fact, and we have to figure out what to do about that. Um, but also, like, if we look at the whole system, we can say, oh, we're going to be inaccurate no matter what we do here in some ways. And maybe that'll inform whether we send everybody home and uh, maybe give some of them ankle monitors or ask them to check back in versus detaining all of the ones that we think are high risk, for example. Um, so I think, uh, I don't know if this is like coming out as articulately as I would like it to, but uh, I guess, um, like I said at the end, when we treat someone through one of these kind of automated systems, uh, what we're doing is we're just treating someone another, we're just giving someone some treatment, and presumably there are ethical ways of treating people. And that's kind of not much more than what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about like maybe a subset of ethical concerns. Uh, but just meeting those demands. And it's gonna be kind of hard to give more than a one liner there, but I think, it's, I think it's doable. I don't think it's like at the outset saying it's gonna be a super high standard. In fact, it might be a very reasonable standard and in part because if you look at the context, I think that the, what people can demand in any situation is gonna be sensitive to kind of what's feasible, what's possible. Um, I hope that doesn't sound like 
empty and trivial? I hope that kind of gets to the heart of the question. Uh, so next question is going to come from um, Michael, a PhD studying computer science. Uh, great, thanks. Um, so thanks for that talk, Clinton. Um, I, I think this is still in line with what you've been talking about already, but um, when, when do you think there are cases, like what, how would you figure out if there are cases when just the use of predictive scoring itself violates like substantive fairness? And this is something that people have said already about the use of uh, criminal recidivism scores. Um, and I noticed that I saw in your uh, Phil People profile that you have some work about consumer scoring data. So uh, that's sort of a kind of something I'd be interested in hearing more about. Yeah, so, um, let me see. Um, so well, I guess is, is the question just sort of, are there, what, what are the cases where it just can't be used? Is it sort of kind of? Yeah, yeah, I, I would like, I think, I would, I'd love to hear what do you think those cases are or are there yeah. maybe some criteria, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I guess I, I, guess I have some thoughts about that. Um, the, uh, the overarching thought would be, I, I don't know if I would want to say, I, I wouldn't want to commit that there's like one context where it couldn't, shouldn't be used. Um, but I would want to say that it kind of depends more on how it's being used. So I guess, um, uh, I, I mean, this is going to be, I wish I could say something more interesting, but like, I think that, you know, you should be certain that you're reliable and, and that the extent to which you're being reliable and accurate, that uh, that's sensitive to um, the stakes involved, right? So uh, just for, for an example, right? maybe there's a good way to use these for hiring and recidivism, maybe not. But it's not whether you use them, but it's how. And if you're going to use them for those kinds of situations, you should have high standards for being accurate. Um, and also, I think that, so I think it should be, should be accurate. Um, sorry, there's, I don't know if you guys can hear this. There's a big thunderstorm right now. <laughs> My lights just went out. So hopefully, again, <laughs> I don't lose everybody. Um, it's just kind of distracting. Um, um, I also think that you you should be sensitive to other things that people might might reasonably demand, like some level of transparency um, and other things like that. But I I think personally I don't know if I have any kind of hard and fast rules, because more the more I think about this, the more I think it's like what should judges be doing when they do this? What should hirers be doing when they do this? And and, and those those questions can be kind of local. And we do have to do these things. And maybe sometimes the computers can improve accuracy. I know that with a lot of the with the criminal justice stuff, they can improve consistency a lot which could seem like very important. And then there's kind of a question is, at what cost does that come and how can we achieve that consistency without trading against something else that's more important? Um, and how can we kind of, yeah. So <laughs> I guess hopefully it gives you kind of an insight at least to how, how I've been thinking about it. Yeah, that's great, thank you. So the next question is from Will Bateman um, in our project, but then I'll go to one from the Q&A after that. Thanks, Seth, and thanks, Clinton. That was a really fabulous presentation. Um, uh, my question, and I haven't sort of worked out all of its implications, uh, the, the question is really about the, uh, the kind of broader impact of being able to uh, quantify and really uh, transparently identify reasoning processes uh, that involve uh, some type, what we would understand as discriminatory uh, patterns of thought because they involve protected attributes, race, sex, uh, age, disability, etc. Um, and, I, and I come at this from the perspective of working on a paper with a machine learner and a philosopher where we're thinking about the, the dilemma that um, designers of ethical systems are placed in because if they uh, work on historically biased data sets, then the, um, the automatic response will often be a type of um, disparate impact discrimination to use US legal terminology. Um, but if they try and avoid that by tweaking um, the decision criteria by reference to protected attributes, they embroil themselves in liability for um, disparate treatment. Uh, and it, it, the, the, the thing that's really come, come out strongly from thinking through this dilemma and how you'd fix it from a law reform perspective is that um, the broader implication 
of being able to to really clearly quantify and identify exactly how to, exactly the weight that you're according in each step of your decision making process to a protected attribute. Um, it 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 ha it has these it has these broader implications for the way that we design and think about discrimination law. Full stop, because the way that we've gotten around the black box of the human brain in terms of discrimination uh, or liability for discriminatory behavior is by saying, look, we can't work out exactly how prejudiced you were and we can't work out um, whether you were discriminating on the basis of protected attributes uh, in, uh, in a type of good faith way or if you were doing it because you're just racist. Uh, and so we will just implement a blanket rule that says any reasoning process whatsoever, which includes any of these protected attributes is ex facie without anything more unlawful and discriminatory. Um, and it just, it seems to me that there's this, and this is my, I'm asking, I suppose, to reflect on my now very long setup. Um, it seems to me that there's this broader implication if you can actually start to really clearly quantify and identify exactly the way that your reasoning in respect of these attributes and in respect of non-protected attributes, kind of legitimate attributes um, that aren't protected that might impact the way that we design our laws more generally because we might be able to or, or, or at least we might be able to say look for automated systems we have a different rule where um, it's not just any involved any engagement with a protected attribute in your reasoning process which involves liability it's whether or not you're doing um, you're including that protected attribute for a kind of legitimate purpose or you're doing your best um, not to be prejudiced and not to be discriminatory, which has a whole set of other really complicated evaluative conclusions. But um, so yeah, that, that's my uh, sort of before 10 a.m. coffee ramble. Um, mm -hmm. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it because I think you've thought really deeply about it. Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. I, um, so I, I guess like I take it that the, the kind of um, the core of the question is, should there be maybe different rules for the automated decision systems with respect to maybe blanket bans on using protected attributes as, as part of your reasoning or something like that? Yes, that's, th thanks. That, that's one, one core, that, that is one core. The other core is, do we have to rethink discrimination law more generally if you start to get to a point with, um, with different types of ML systems where you can actually really clearly identify the, the weightings given to different types of attributes in a very broad set of applications. And so you're starting to use these systems very broadly um, and displacing a lot of independent human, uh, that you're di displacing a lot of black boxes with a lot of really clearly identified algorithms, clearly specified algorithms. Yeah, so I, I, think, I think it's really interesting. As somebody who's like not a lawyer, I, I get a little bit uneasy <laughs> with, with some of this stuff because I don't understand the law perfectly well. I, um, but let me think through the first, the first question, um, and I think it bears on the second of whether there should be a different rule for this, for the algorithms. I think you, you, I think you might have touched on this. So like, given the caveat I just made, I'm, I'm not sure how to think about this. Um, but I, I guess one benefit of these systems is you could give, you could show I mean, I think that there's going to be a really hard question of even if it's going to improve fairness or whatever, if it's going to improve one goal in one way, if including race and gender, presume that including race or gender or whatever will, will, will have some improvement. There's like this further question of whether, of, of how to make the kind of more holistic decision of whether to start rigging things up that way. And you might, you might worry about all sorts of things, um, like re reifying some ideas. Um, for example, but um, one benefit, I guess, it's, so, so I think it's going to be really messy business, but I think you already said this, one benefit of this could be that you could be completely clear about what the reasoning is and show that it's being used in a certain kind of way, right, and, and kind of lay out explicitly, like, these are the rules, this is what's going to happen, not maybe perfectly deterministically, but you can at least think about that in a way where you're not going to have to worry about anything implicit, implicit in the reasoning that's going on there and you could also i guess you could also run some tests on it to make sure that it's not going to have sort of implicit problems um but beyond that i don't i don't really have a good theory about how to think about this and i get really 
I, I get really kind of queasy talking about the law and, and uh, kind of policy solutions, because I know that that is a, that's sort of outside of what I know how to do as a philosopher. And it's kind of a, it's tricky. I just, I just recognize it as like really tricky business. Uh, so I don't know, I'm not sure if I have much. Let me, um, let me just cut that. in there. So, so first of all, you guys should keep talking um, on, the, on the Slack and um, you can sort of avail yourself of the, of the folks in our project, Clinton, who, um, who have experience. Damien um, also um, would be a great person to talk to as well as well. Um, but let me just try and get to a question from our audience. So Jessica Court has asked, and I'll just pass this straight through to you, um, Clinton. Could we treat machine learning bias in the same way as cognitive bias in real world implementation of human in the loop um, systems? So for example, you might say, look, it says there's a 60% chance of recidivism, but we can also see that the person is low socioeconomic status and black. So be aware of the bias in making a final decision. So do you think we can sort of compensate for the uh, problems with respect to formal fairness by sort of judiciously using these systems um, in order to make a decision that ultimately is a human decision? Um, I, I think that there might be some hope for that, and, I, and I'm pretty sure, I, I can't remember exactly which one, but one of the computer science papers identified by Corbett Davies and company, uh, I think gets into some of this, and one of their recommendations actually, I, mean, I don't know if this is quite a recommendation, uh, I'd have to look at the paper again, and, and I might invite Jessica to do that too, um, but um, I, I think that one of the recommendations is, I gave this contrived example of how we might force parity to, to try to achieve fairness, um, in, in one of the cases where that we have a uh, calibrated system that looks unfair for, for various reasons. Um, and one of their um, recommendations is you could probably do it that way. I mean, you might be able to kind of break things up that way, but it would be better to let the system run calibrated and then make a judgment outside of it using, I think, some more, some further context. Um, and so I, I do think that, that, pro that there's at least some, one good reason to have a human on the loop is maybe that they could, we could say like, look, there is this system that tends to be better than people, but it does systematically make some kinds of errors. And so we can consult its outputs and then we can look at the broader context and make maybe some further judgment calls and hopefully improve, improve accuracy that way. Um, and, 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 and I mean, I guess on that note too, there are other reason, good reasons to have humans on the loop uh, it, with these kind of automated cases because we, we've seen them kind of, they can be really s spectacular certain things, but they can also kind of make mistakes that only make mistake only seem like reasonable mistakes from their bizarre point of view but humans can kind of spot certain kinds of mistakes as kind of obviously incorrect so i think that i think oftentimes having a human kind of on the loop in the loop is is a is a good idea uh for various reasons but then i guess you get into the tricky business of like whether people are going to overcorrect or not and i think that's also going to be very difficult it depends on what that person's kind of training and skills are i guess this is a good point to move us over to the Slack. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna track down, there's a great paper that showed that judges responding to predictive scores were more likely to override them when um, they went against their prior prejudice. So you got the biased algorithm and then you got the racist judges and you just get the worst of both worlds. Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll put that one up on, um, on the Slack. And um, Matthew Phillips had a great point at the end there as well. Um, about the, the consequences for, um, for individual judges of going against a predicted score, um, where if the score proves to be sort of um, confirmed, that that might end up being something that goes against their record, which they might want to protect. Um, but we can continue that kind of chat over on the Slack. For now, let's, uh, let's all thank Clinton 